my name is Heikki Linnagangas. I work for VMware. Um, I'm here to talk about timelines in Postgres. So the thing with timelines, uh, this originates back to release 8.1 when, when Postgres got point-in-time recovery. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about point-in-time recovery first so we understand where this is coming from. Um, point-in-time recovery is a feature you use when you do something stupid in your database, like you know, drop a table you didn't intend to, or you forget the where clause in your delete statement. Um, so what you're going to do in this situation is that once you realize you've done something stupid, you're going to kill the server and you restore from the backup and you try to restore the backup to the point just before the delete. And then what typically happens is that you accidentally restore it too far and then you restore from the backup again and you try to find the right location where the error happened. So the thing with timelines is that they help, they help you manage this situation where you restart the recovery many times. Um, every time you do a new restore from a backup, a new timeline is created. On a single server, the timelines are pretty boring. It basically looks like this. There is just a single line in time, um, and there isn't much to it. Uh, but however, there is, I'm using the same notation in all the slides. Um, so time flows from left to right, and there's things happen during time, which is like inserts and updates and so forth. Um, and Postgres will create a record in the transaction log for all these operations. Um, so even though the feature is called point in time recovery, what it's really all about is about restoring to a certain point in the transaction log. So time is really defined by the transaction log. Um, if you say you want to restore to a certain point in time, you mean to a certain point in the transaction log. So with point in time recovery, the timelines get more interesting. So what you have here is the base backup. Actually, I should use this now that I have it. Um, <coughs> And this is where you do the delete without the where clause, and then time moves on until you realize that you did something stupid. And at that point, you can't move back in time. So what you need to do is you go back to your backup here, and you restore the, the right ahead log until you, you reach this point, and then, then you start up the database, and you realize that, oops, it went too far. You already went past the delete. So that created timeline number two. So now you go back to the backup again, you restore, and now you have hit the right point just before that stupid delete statement, and you success, success to create, do what you want to do, and that becomes timeline number three. So all these timelines have an ID number, which you can use to differentiate them or tell them apart. Um, which is kind of in important because otherwise if you restore from backup, recover, or restore from the backup again, there's going to be multiple, well, timelines where you have the same positions in the transaction log, but they're not actually the same thing because you recovered and now, now you have different data that happened at that point in time. So the timelines help you to differentiate between the transaction log position on one time and the same position on another, another timeline. One, one interesting point is that whenever, even though the timelines branch, but if you are, if you have a running server at a certain point in time, like here, if you follow backwards, you can always trace the history back to the beginning of time or the begin, be, beginning of the while. And it's always linear from the point of view of a single server. So a single server doesn't really ever see these different timelines. It only sees its own timeline, which goes back all the way in history, uh, you might switch. You might switch to different timeline on the way, but it, it, it is clear 
culture history goes back to the beginning of time. Um, by the way, if there's any questions, just shoot. Uh, this is kind of a collection of random thoughts related to our, our timeline. So if there's any questions, just ask. Um, so this is what the timelines look like in your WAL archive or in your PGX log directory. The Postgres writes the transaction logs in these 16 megabyte segments, which are named like this, so the numbers increase. But if you have, if you have different timelines in your archive, uh, we bump the first number here. And I think I have a better slide on this, yeah. So what you can see here is that this is the first timeline with the ones in here and the transaction log numbers increase. And this is the point where we forked off the second timeline with ID 2, and you have the same numbers here. If we didn't have timeline IDs, we couldn't tell these apart, which would lead into all kinds of problems, like you couldn't use the same while archive to archive both of the timelines. You'd have to keep them in separate directories or something. Uh, but thanks to the timeline IDs, you can tell them apart, and you can just collect them all in your same, same wall archive, and the system will keep them separate. So at the end of recovery, first of all, if you have a master server that's running, or, or if, you cr if you recover from a crash, uh, you, do end of re you replay all the logs until you reach the end, and that's the end of recovery. Um, however, but if you're recovering, if you're doing point in time recovery, things work differently. Then we create these timelines. Um, so the recovery ends when you stop replaying the while and you start accepting connections that can write or do new transactions that write to the database. A hot standby will never end recovery until you, well, take it out of the standby mode. So at the end of the timeline, the system chooses a new timeline ID. And in this case, it, it, will, it will choose the new timeline ID by scanning the WAL archive and checking what timeline IDs are already, already in use. So if you have timelines one and two and three there already, it will see that, OK, one is used, two is used, three is used. So it will pick the next one that's available, and the next timeline will, will become four. Um, So after it's decided which, what the, the ID of the new time is going to be, it's going to write a timeline history file. And the timeline history file helps the system to trace back. If you go backwards, the timeline history file contains a line for each of these points where we fork to a new timeline. So if, for example, if we had the fourth timeline that forks off here, the timeline history file would tell you that, OK, this is where we switch to timeline four. This is where we switch to timeline two, and so forth. And I think I have more on that. OK, so here's an example of what it looks like in the logs when you end recover. Uh, you can see here it starts archive recovery, starts reading the logs until it hits the end of logs which in this case, it hits because it doesn't find the next file anymore. Um, so it's going to tell you that, OK, I'm done. And this is the new timeline ID I chose. After that, it's, it starts up. Mm, after, after, after the it has ended recovery, it's going to copy the last transaction log file under the new name. Because, um, so what, what happens is uh, while, while it was still writing the old timeline, it's going to stop recovery somewhere in the middle of the file, typically. Um, you can't, we don't want to have partial files where you have, like, the first half is empty and it continues on the second half. So what it does, it copies the partial contents of the previous, uh, from the previous timeline under the same name, except that it changes the timeline ID. And this part is identical in both files. Um, but starting after it has started up, it's going to write new transactions at the rest of the file. 
So I mentioned timeline history files. These are little files that will appear in your PGXLog directory and in your WAL archive. And uh, as I said earlier, this is the file that tells what the history of this timeline is. Well, what are the points? How did we arrive in this point in time? It looks like this. Um, for, so every time the system switches to a new timeline, it will copy the old history file for the previous timeline and append one more row to it. So you can see this is the timeline it forked from. And you can see that this file is named number three dot history, which means this is the timeline history file for timeline number three. And what it means is that the previous timeline was two where this forked from. And you have here the location in the transaction log where that happened. Uh, by the way, I think this is new. This is new in 9.3. In 9.2, this used to be just a file name, but in 9.3, this actually contains the exact location of the timeline switch. Um, this was, it's just nice to have more accuracy there, but the, the reason I needed that was in 9.3 for the, some changes to in streaming replication to allow you to replicate this. Um, anyway, now you have the exact location in the transaction log where the switch happened. And there's also a reason why it happened. In this case, it shows at risk Tor point called before PGCon, which means that I had specified uh, in the recover.conf file, I had specified that I want to recover the certain named risk Tor point, which was called before PGCon. And uh, the reason we switched to a new timeline is that we found that point and the system switched as, as I requested it. Um, yeah. Um, in the previous slide, we had timeline two and timeline three. Now, is timeline two created a new history? How is known not to be the same number as timeline three that you used for? So that it kind of selects them based on what history it has. Yeah. So the question is, how does it know which history is, which timeline IDs are already in use? Um, it uses the restore command, the same, because these, these history files are archived together with the actual transaction log files. Uh, so they get archived with the archive command, just like the transaction log files. Or in 9.3, if you're using stream replication, they will actually be replicated, just like the transaction log files. Um, so what it basically does, it just scans by calling the restore command and polling and checking which numbers are already in use. So if it's, if it's currently on timeline two, it's going to check if timeline three exists, if there's a history file for timeline three. Uh, if it finds it, then it checks the next one, is there, is there a history file for timeline four and so forth until it finds one that's not there yet. Um, so there could be a race condition here if you have multiple servers and you do this at the same time in two servers, but that would be kind of weird. So you're assuming that all of these history files are going into the same archive directory. Yeah, right? that's correct. That's how they know about future timelines that other timelines have already claimed, is that right? Yeah, that's correct. So this assumes that the uh, Everyone is writing to the same wall archive. Okay. So one confusing point here is to remember that the first line here, or the first column here, is the timeline ID of the parent timeline. So as you can see, this is the history file for number three. And there is no line for number three because we are still on that timeline. We never switched off that timeline. But you do have records for number two and number one. And that's also the reason why there is no timeline history file for the first timeline, timeline one, because that is what you automatically get when you just do an init DB, and you never really switched into that. And it, it has no parents. So other reasons you might see here is if you said, uh, uh, if you in recovery.conf, if you set a recovery target to a certain point in time, if you have a timestamp there, then this will say what the timestamp was. Or if you have an X ID there, it will tell you, I mean, what was the reason that we did the switch? 
So one important random thought here is that these timeline history files, we have a bit of an unfortunate naming scheme here. So what I talked about in the previous slide was timeline history files, but these are not to be confused with backup history files, which are a completely different thing. Uh, you create backup history files when you do backups, and timeline history files when you restore. Okay? Uh, so just, just to show you what the backup history file looks like, uh, here's one. So when you do PG start backup, we create a file that looks like this. It's named like that. There's a, the current xlog segment and followed by a location where the backup started, I think. And, uh, or maybe it's where it stopped, I, I don't remember. Uh, dot backup. Um, this file, this file is just for information purposes. The Postgres never actually reads this file. Uh, it's there just so that you know, you can look at it your, yourself manually and see when you did a backup and how far you need to keep the log to still be able to restore that file. Um, so this is called a backup history file. It's different from a timeline history file. This, this kind of confusion continues. There's also something called backup label files, which is again different from backup history files and different from timeline history files. And what makes this confusing is that it looks kind of similar to the backup history file on the previous slide. But this file is important. If you do a backup, it's important that you include this file in your backup. And this is all documented, but uh, I've seen people in several instances of people actually on purpose either deleting this file from their backups thinking that it's just, you know, it's just the label, we don't really need that, or you know, just going through effort to actually exclude that from the backup, which is wrong. You have to include it. Um, we improved the documentation <laughs> lately to make this more explicit. Um, but the naming, naming is a bit inconvenient here. So just to summarize, there are three files. There's the backup label file, which you shouldn't touch. You can read it. It's human readable, but it's also read by the system, and it's very important for uh, getting a consistent system. Then there's this backup history file, which is only for um, your information. You can delete them if you want. And then there's the timeline history files, which are created when you create a new timeline. And these are also important if you ever want to recover you know, through those timelines, which is, you can delete old history files if you really don't need them anymore, but they're tiny. They're only like 100 bytes or something, so you might as well just keep them all. Is there any questions at this point? No? I have one. Sure. So That's it correct. It's consistent recovery state info from the log itself. Yeah. This, this actually changed. I think in, in 9.1 or at some point, well, maybe it was 9.1 where we changed this so that we no longer read the backup history file. So in earlier, we used to read it in earlier versions, um, but we don't do that anymore. <coughs> so nowadays it's just for you know, human consumption. Yes? So yeah, if you have, if, if you try to restore from a base backup on two servers at the same time that are both pointing to the same while archive, what could happen is that they both, there's a race condition where they might both see that, okay, timeline number two is used, timeline number three is used, the next one that's free is number three. And then they both pick the same timeline, which is three, and then you get an error when you try to, when it tries to actually write or archive that file. Uh, we don't have any protection against that at the moment. So, I mean, in general, it's unsafe to have two different servers on different, uh, that are writing to the same archive, right? I mean, if they speak out for reasons exactly like that, right? Well, yeah, usually you wouldn't have that. But you might if you, for some reason, it's perfectly okay to point two servers to the same wall archive if they're both running um, on a different timeline, if they are actually both copies of the same system just running on different timelines. I'm not sure exactly why you would do that, but maybe 
maybe you have a database, production database, and you want to fork that temporarily for some reason. Maybe try out something. I don't know. Um, Yeah, it's not really safe. If you, it's a very small, and you won't run into that in practice very often, I would think. Um, but it's it's possible. So the race condition only happens when you start up the database and it switches to a new timeline. Uh, so as long as you make sure you don't like recover both of them at the same time, then you should be safe. So it is at that instant that the postmaster tries to determine what should be the next. Right. Yeah, that's true. The, the, the new timeline is determined when it's actually going to switch yeah, at the end of the recovery. That's the best we can do with that situation. Yeah. I mean, I guess we could try to do better and actually try to write and archive the history file and then back up or, or you know, choose a new one if it fails or something, but we, we haven't bothered. So, so one thing I hear sometimes is that, well, I mean, this doesn't really apply to me because I'm not planning to do point-in-time recovery or I never do point-in-time recovery. So, you know, what's the big deal with these timelines? That's just confusing. Um, I'd just like to point out that you are going to get new timelines whenever you do a failover on a hot standby system. And there is a good reason for that. Uh, some people have tried to actually hack around that by you know, shutting down the database and manually removing recovery of cons so that it doesn't create a new timeline. Uh, but I wouldn't recommend that because typically if you do failover, um, you might have some, you might have already done some transactions on the master server before you shut down. You probably want to avoid that, but it happens. So it's actually very useful to have the, the timeline. Okay, so here's a slide on that. So if you, if you have a master server and the master crashes, you promote a, you have a standby server and you promote that, it will create a new timeline. So you might think it looks something like this. But in reality, it's actually more like point in time recovery what happens. Because in a typical scenario where you do failover, the master crashes and you have a hot standby system, but it might not be totally up to date. The master might already have applied some transactions or might not even be like user transactions. It might be a vacuum that ran in the background that created some, some uh, <coughs> records in the transaction log. So when you, do a, when you promote the standby server, it creates a new timeline. And the right thing to do here, and this is what the system will do, is it creates a new timeline because it, it might not continue from where the master left off. <coughs> And you might have some lost updates here, or maybe not if you're lucky, or if you, you know, manage this process well, and it's a control shutdown, you can avoid that. But, it, but in the general case, um, a new timeline is the right thing to do. So one thing I hear people saying to that is that, well, I don't really have that problem because I use synchronous replication. So I won't have any lost updates because they will be in sync all the time. Well, it's not true, unfortunately. Um, in synchronous replication, um, what synchronous replication does is it delays sending back the acknowledgement to a commit. So if you do a commit, it won't return to the user application until, it has, in, until the commit record has been replicated to the standby. But that's all it does. Um, it's still written to the disk on the master first, so it's entirely possible that when you do an update and the, the client does a commit, it never returns. And it was, oops, I lost audio, I think. Did I? Yeah. OK. I'll just speak up louder, I guess. <laughs> um, which one is it? That's the other one. This one's the one. OK. It seems to be doing something, but. Is that better? No. No? 
battery? I think so. Yeah, I, I have avoided doing any back to the future references in yeah. the talk. If anyone has any, this would be a good time to come up. Does it work? Does it work now? <laughs> no. Does it work now? No. <coughs> Hello? No? Well, I can just try to speak up. Can you hear me in the back? Okay, I'll just continue with that. this one. The one that's actually recording is working. Um, so where was I? So if you, even if you use synchronous replication, you still have the same problem that there might be some transactions that are on the master but are not yet replicated to the standby. Uh, what synchronous replication will do, it will, uh, it will reduce that window, but it's still always there. In, in general, you can't, I mean, it doesn't solve the problem at all. And even if you somehow manage to stop any trans transactions running on the master, uh, there's still, Postgres is still doing all kinds of stuff in the background. There's checkpoints, there's auto vacuum, analyze, all kinds of stuff still running. And they will write new transaction logs even if you don't do anything to the database yourself. Oops. Okay, so you do use point in time recovery even if you might not realize it yet or you might not want to, but you do. Um, so it's important to know what these timelines are and just embrace them and learn to use them and it will keep, it will keep you sane when you have to deal with these situations. And in 9.3, there's a few enhancements to this. Um, so this is something I spend a lot of time in the 9.3 release cycle, much more than, oh. okay. <laughs> so I spend a lot of time on this and uh, I thought it was just a, would be a small few days, maybe a week uh, to do this, but it turned out to be months and months of uh, development and fixing bugs. Uh, but it's there now. So before 9.3, in previous versions, if you wanted to do, if you wanted to have a standby server and a master server, set up in a way, actually if you have a master server and two standby servers and you wanted to them to be set up so that when you do a failover to one standby server, the other standby will automatically connect to the new standby and it will follow the timeline switch and keep following the standby on the new timeline. Uh, okay, maybe I should use it. So. So, so before 9.3, you had to have a wall archive for that. You couldn't do it with just a streaming replication. Um, in 9.3, you can. Uh, what the streaming replication will now do is that when it hits, when it's connected to a standby, a cascading standby server, and the upstream standby server switches to a new timeline, it will tell the downstream standby okay, I re you now reach the point where I switch to a new timeline, you know, stop streaming, and it will stop streaming and the standby server will ask the master, the new master, um, what is your new timeline? It will fetch all the timeline history files from the upstream server. This is all new that I had to write because there wasn't anything previously in the replication protocol to actually get the history files. Uh, so it will now, stream the history files and it will actually fetch all the history files, um, not only the one you're recovering do. And this is for the reason that Bruce asked, you know, how does the server know what, what's the next timeline ID that's not, still not in use? 
Um, so in streaming replication, it will fetch all the timeline history files, even the like, future ones that are not interesting for the server itself. Because if you then later do a failover from that server, it needs the history files just to tell you which IDs are still unused. Okay. Um, so this was kind of complicated, but it now works. You can do you, you can have two standby servers and failover between them without having a wall archive. Before 9.3, you could still do this, but you had to have the wall archive and the restore command set up. Yes. Yeah. A falls down. Yep. In 9.2, I got B up, and then C comes, and I get this dreaded thing that says I'm not on the same timeline. I don't know what to do. With yes, that. exactly. But now in 9.3, I fail with B, and C is to do the timeline switch automatically. Yes, that's exactly right. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, that turned out to be a bit difficult, but it, it managed to do it in the end. Also, also, I did the same thing for PG Receive Xlog, which is actually a very nice tool. If you haven't used it, you should check it out. It's a tool that ships with Postgres that basically allows you to store the Xlog files on a disk like a while archive, but it, use, it, doesn't recover, it, it doesn't use the restore command mechanism to do that. Instead, it will connect to the server using streaming replication, and it will just stream them to a file. Uh, so, so the end result is the same as a while archive. You have the Xlog files there, uh, but it's created by you know, streaming. Um, so the PTA, uh, receive Xlog can now do the same thing as the standby server. It will follow the timeline switch, and if, if it's connected to a server that gets promoted or oh, it follows another timeline, it will also fetch all the history files and write them to disk and then decide what to do next and follow, follow the switch. Um, so, cool. So, there's one more thing I'm going to cover, and this is something I just uh, wrote a while back. Um, so, one problem you still have if you have this master and standby is that if you, if you fail over from master to a standby server, and then you want to fail back, um, you have to, s have to re restart the old master server from a base backup, basically. Um, this is, a, this is a something that new users who are not familiar with this will be hor horrified when they hear. It's like, <laughs> you know, I have a 10 terabyte database. There's no way I can just recover from a base backup every time. Um, so the way, kind of the standard way to do this is that you restore from the base backup and you set recovery target timeline to latest, probably. And then you roll forward all the logs from the base backup. Um, so yeah, this is just the same with the graph. A uh, faster way to do this is, is to use rsync, uh, which is nice. So if you have a master and the standby server, you fail over and then you try to fail back, <coughs> what you need to do is to do pg start backup on the new master server, and then you rsync. Instead of doing a new base backup, you use rsync to sync up the master directory in the, or the data directory in the old master. And then you call stop backup, and then you can recover it like you would recover a base backup. And this is much faster than recovering a full base backup, because rsync only has to you know, extend the difference. Uh, but the problem is still that if you have a 10 terabyte database, it still has to actually read through that 10 terabytes on both systems so that it can see if it's changed. So, yeah, here's the same with the graph. So, you might have seen my post recently on hackers. I wrote a little tool um, called PG Rewind, which does the same thing as rsync. It determines what has changed, but it actually does this by reading the uh, transaction log. And I think this was pretty cool. Um, I originally started working on this when Andreas Freund uh, did some work on in 9.3 to make it easier to write tools that read the transaction log. So there is now a way to create small C, uh, write tools in C that can read the transaction log and do stuff with them. So in Postgres 9.3, there is a tool called 
uh, pgxlog dump, which is just a debugging tool, and that's the like reference implementation of how you use this. But I wrote this little tool that can read the lo logs and do more stuff with it. Uh, I started doing this just basically to check that the interface is okay with the Excel credo stuff that Andreas wrote, but it's actually a pretty nice tool. Uh, Robert Haas pointed out on list that this doesn't actually work, uh, which is kind of unfortunate. But I think it will work if you also enable checksums, which kind of solves the problem with the hint bits that it has. So there's a little caveat with this, that it, it requires you to also enable checksums, which is another new feature in 9.3. Um, but I think it will work after that. So what it, how it actually works, it, first of all, it will copy all the files that are not normal relation files, like you know, your configuration files and uh, uh, control file and all kinds of uh, the map visibility and free space map. It will also currently just copy as is. Because that's, that's always safe. It's always safe to just copy what's there in the master over. Um, so. But the optimization here is that it uses the transaction logs to check so that it wouldn't have to check the copy over the actual data files, which are the majority of your database. Um, it uses transaction logs to determine which blocks have changed, and then it all only copies over those. Yeah? This should be used on the new, the new master, or it can also be used on the same master to test all the time, all the time, and on several, several um, you can use it pretty much you know, either way, I think. It's, so the typical scenario would be that you have a master and a slave. Let's call them A and B. And uh, A goes down, and you promote B to be the new master. And then you bring A back up, and you want it to become a standby. So you, at that point, you would use this tool, PG Rewind, or one of the like rsync mechanism to sync it back up with the uh, with the new master or yeah. B. Can this be used as a cheap way to make B become to reslate B back to A? Yeah. <coughs> yes, you can do that. Um, if you if you can control this thing so that you don't like have a power loss or anything, you don't actually need a tool like this. You can just shut down cleanly. And you have to somehow ensure that you get all the transaction logs copied over before you do the timeline switch. Then you won't need a tool like this. It will be safe to just make the old master be a slave. I'm not sure if we have documented that or if we, what kind of, I'm not sure what kind of checks we have, like sanity checks for that. Um, but it should be possible to do that. If you just create a recovery.conf file in a master server, it will become a slave. Um, the the, I didn't understand which is the source. And like you have your master and then A or B, whatever you want to open. Yep. Uh, in the case you are talking about here, where you say before it was in shutdown, I can maybe open the master. So that if all these things you don't know, then they go down. So is that what you were saying? I'm sorry, I didn't understand. <laughs> Maybe we can take that offline later. So, so this is how you use it. One cool thing with this tool is it does, doesn't actually require a shell access. Uh, it does all of this through libpq. Because uh, there happens to be these nice helper functions in Postgres. It requires super user access on the master server. But there, is, there happens to be these nice little functions you can do to uh, build in functions to list directories. Like you can list the data directory, and there's functions to fetch or read files and send them over. So I just use those and select queries that reads all the files, which was a nice trick, I thought. <laughs> uh, it's experimental. It's out there. Uh, needs 9.3 because of the stuff that Andreas did there. So, so with rsync and uh, PC Rewind as well, you can. You can actually use this mechanism to sync any, as long as they have a common ancestor, right? Uh, so if you have, 
a situation where you, you like fork off from here and you have like four timelines that all branch off from some ancient history timeline, you can use rsync to s still sync these up uh, on any of these timelines because it will just work. And the same with the uh, PG Rewind. Uh, it just means that it has to read all the log from where they branched off to different branches in time. Um, that's really all I have. Is there any questions? There's got to be questions, more questions. Yes? Okay. It's not foolproof. It's not foolproof. We've been adding more sanity checks to the recovery like code path over years. Uh, <coughs> in general, this has be, all this messing around with timelines and you know restoring from backups, um, streaming replication, all this stuff. We've been adding more sanity checks into these code paths over the years. So. If you take 9.0, there's a lot more like, opportunity to screw things up and have a database that starts up silently and you won't notice that it's actually co completely corrupt. Uh, it's getting harder to do that, but there are still ways to screw up. Um, yes? The question is when, when, do you, when is it safe to delete all the timeline history files? Um, you, yeah, if you never intend to recover, if you have a base backup and that's the oldest base backup you're ever interested in, then anything older than that you can delete. Um, yeah. PG archive? PG archive cleanup. Archive cleanup. Oh, that's a command. Yeah, I don't know. I have no idea. Uh, it tells you the oldest xlog file, but I don't know if it, I guess you could extract the timeline ID from that, but I don't think it's designed to do that. Uh, but as I said, they're small, so just keep them around. There's no harm. Yeah, I think like basically any, if you really did want to clean those up, if you really, really wanted to, any history file with a timeline earlier than whatever is the present timeline as long as you are not going to try to restore from a base backup that was on an earlier timeline, you could get rid of this. Yes. Not, again, you know, you might discover something interesting and need to restore your database to two months ago, and that might be, it might or might not be impossible about those history files. Yeah. So if there's no more questions, um, I'm unfortunately done. Thank you. <laughs>